think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Used now, and NASA has just confirmed the existence of seven Earth sized planets which could sustain life. Stop. That guy's perfect for the role. You're right, he's good. Live from Earth. Initial observations. Planet Earth. Ever evolving for millennia. Has generated countless environmental challenges for an infinite variety of inhabitants. Survival and degree of longevity has depended on how well a species can adapt to changes in climate predators, and food sources. One species has proven particularly good at adapting to and surviving changing habitats, humans. Humans are conditioned to recognize and take precautions for most potential dangers in their artificial urban environments. But the majority do little to protect themselves from the toxic surroundings and lifestyle habits that don't support the continued evolution of their bodies. Humans have evolved and adapted to various habitats for 200,000 years. Suddenly, in the last 50 years, the food sources and habitats they created changed so radically that they have become hazardous to humans themselves. Chronic disease is on the rise while both quality and length of life is on the decline. This would suggest the conflict between the human body and its environment has reached critical mass. People have no concept of what a normal amount of activity is like. They get up in the morning, they um, go to work, and they sit. They sit all day, they go for lunch, they sit. I'm just at a desk in a conference room on my laptop. They might walk to the photocopier and you know copy a few things, and then they go back in their car, back home, sit in the couch, have something to eat, go to bed. They think that that's a normal lifestyle. That's not normal, that's just common. 80% of my time is spent sitting down. And Maybe I'd get up to go to a meeting. I would come back, eat lunch at my desk. Sedentary activities, everybody's using their cell phones, everybody's on the computer, everybody's in this position, and then all of those postures are just making it all so much more difficult for the body to function in a normal fashion. I was hunched over and I was in excruciating pain. At the end of my school year, my back went out completely again. I've been in pain for 15 years. I'll have people in their 30s and they'll talk about, oh, I have this shoulder pain or I have this knee pain. Oh, it's probably just because I'm aging. I'm going, really? You know, at that age, you think that that's reasonable? I said it's typically neglect. People of my age, after 55, are struggling to kind of maintain a level of fitness. I think my biggest challenge was exercise. You no, know, and you don't want to live to be 90 and spend the last 15 years of your life you know, sitting on a couch because you've got, you know, bad joints and bad limbs and your organs are blown out and you're in bad shape. Like all animals on the planet, humans have base pairs of DNA coding designed to ensure reproduction 
and drive the survival of the species. The two biological imperatives which have propelled them to surpass all predators in natural habitats are resting as much as possible and consuming as much calorically dense food as possible. The progress humans have made in the last century is astonishing. But something's wrong. The radically artificial habitats they have created to support lifestyles of comfort and leisure are the same stressful environments that not only work against nature, but also against the human body itself. Last summer became uh, immobile, like I couldn't move anymore. Six months ago, I couldn't walk. I've pretty much struggled with my weight my whole life. I was smoking about a pack and a half a day. Daily living with modern conveniences is killing us. It's not something that you can do whatever you wish until you get to the point where you are at 65 and you say, okay, now I'm going to start taking care of myself because I want to be able to travel the world. Took my health for granted as well, I think, and um, I eventually paid the price. I was having trouble with my left leg and the nerves uh, signal was being sent, but the muscles weren't reacting. And so over the years that built up, to I would my, my foot would drag and therefore you'd start to trip. I was a chain smoker, 75 cigarettes a day. After dinner when I got the munchies, I could sit down and eat an entire apple strudel. Yet I was shocked when a routine pap test confirmed I had cancer of the cervix. Oh, they're just gonna live long, unhealthy, unenjoyable, well, that would be my opinion. Lives. If you choose not to exercise, the unseen damage can accrue until it disables you. Like I couldn't do what I wanted to do. Couldn't go up the stairs without being out of breath. His back was starting to hurt and everything because he couldn't move properly, so everything was sedentary. When they could be playing with the grandkids, they could be, you know, going on trips, they could be out in the park, they could be doing so many enjoyable you know, types of things, whereas sitting and going for dialysis, probably not so enjoyable. The sedentariness and the staticness of the posture of the body um, is changing and affecting people's health in more ways than just, oh, my back bothers me or I feel stiff. A couple of generations ago, humans were healthier. They had stronger muscles because they moved more. Daily physical activity was a way of life for humans young and old. Around the 1950s, there were significant changes. The pursuit of increased household incomes for better lives took female humans from their homes into the workplace. All my girlfriends were on the pill. We all wanted a good education and a career, and we didn't want to be tied to the home. The refocus from home to work created a demand for convenience and reliance on time-saving devices, especially for daily household activities. The arrival of buying on credit introduced the concept of instant gratification to the masses. Appliances, and eventually cars, which were only available for cash in the 1950s, became essential must-haves in the 1960s. When a device called television was introduced a couple of generations ago, the leisure environment for humans moved from mainly outdoor activity to in-home inactivity. Wow, the Sony 4K Ultras are on sale. We should get one. TV is a form of occasional light entertainment graduated to a way of life. But we don't need another TV. We already have three. Most households in North America have at least one TV and the average have more than 2.5. Snuggling up to watch a movie on a big screen with an extra sharp image. More like you sitting here watching sports and me on my iPad keeping you company when you're not out with the guys. At least I'm playing Scrabble or Sudoku or something to keep my brain active. Yet TV pales in comparison to the internet. A communication network that is so powerful it has changed human behavior forever. This connectivity has created an epidemic of sedentary screen time 
and an obsession for games. The average age of a gamer is 38, which is the first generation to grow up with video games. Today, all generations continue to sink deeper into the gaming habit via easy mobile access. They will still sit there for hours on end, you know, with their little joysticks and staring away at, you know, a screen and consider that activity. The average American adult spends more than 11 hours a day of screen time, most of it sitting down. Wow, that's harsh. What do we do now? Not a clue. Why don't we shoot him again and work it into what we already have? You know, this could work. Yeah, let's do it. Hi there, my name is David Jessup. I'm 54 years old, and on April 23rd, 2018, I had a heart attack. Saturday morning, all of a sudden, I woke up and I had this massive burning sensation, pain in my chest, and a shooting pain through my left arm. I mean, I was shocked when the heart attack happened. Sitting is not limited to just work and home. It's also sitting while getting there and back. Humans drive or are driven everywhere. Almost 90% of adults in North America drive or ride to work regardless of distance. For many, cars are essentials rather than luxuries. Vehicles actually outnumber the population of licensed drivers. We have two cars. It takes me about 10 minutes to get to work uh, by car. My office is about uh, seven blocks away from my house. I take the car depending on what meetings I have later on that day. Convenience and advancements in technology allow humans to amuse themselves, order food, shop, learn, work and socialize, all without leaving home, without moving any part of their bodies except their thumbs and sometimes fingers. Sitting is the new smoking. I was sitting at the office all day, and that was very difficult for me. <laughs> Normally I'm sitting at my desk, I'm on the phone mostly. I'm even on the phone calling my teammate David, who's just a couple of doors over. My entire career of four decades was sitting on my butt. I mean, I'm 54 years old. Um, I'm not in the worst shape, but I'm not in the best shape. Um, I wouldn't consider myself sedentary. Um, and I was literally shocked to think that a man that uh, is somewhat active and stays busy, uh, would have a heart attack <clears throat> to this degree at 54 years old. Um, you know, I've ran seven marathons early on in my, um, in my life. And I always said to myself, that's not gonna be me, because it, it can happen to me. I'm physically fit, I'm, you know, that kind of thing. Besides inactivity, human immobility is also impacted by the food they eat, which far exceeds their need for mere survival. I was definitely, uh, you know, a fat, fat kid. Why is overeating the way of life for so many? Fatter teenager, fattest in first year university. We like to have lots of food on the, on the table and large portions. And if I go out for evening, I may have two or three glasses of either wine or a cocktail. The biological imperative that drives the human obsession for excessive food consumption is unique on the planet. Humans are the only mammals that will willingly eat more than they need. Modern habitats, which offer easy food access 24-7, also reinforce human susceptibility to indulge. We're being marketed to every second of every day of all the fun parts of food. This party, this event. The billions of dollars are now being spent on marketing where, you know, neuropsychology and neurophysiology are being used against us. Much of human culture is based on celebration, and celebration, big or small, revolves around and cultivates excess food consumption. Physiologically, your body will crave certain foods because we're designed to want fat. We're designed to want sugar and salt and so on because those are things that were inbred in us as we were hunters and gatherers. 
because those kinds of cravings helped us find the types of food that would be helpful, but it would be in small quantities. Simple carbohydrates like pasta, flour, and sugar are dangerous because they are refined and rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream, causing risky spikes in blood sugar and insulin levels. The higher the insulin level, the more the weight gain. I love pasta. Pasta for starter, pasta for main course, and pasta for dessert. I do have a bit of a sweet tooth from my mom. I like to bake, so <laughs> I like desserts. <laughs> I also eat pie and cake. And I'm going to skip on the beer tonight, but uh, I'll open us up a red. Uh, that'll go good with lasagna. Everybody knows you are what you eat. A lot of bad habits start quite early. Sometimes it's just simply poor family habits and the whole family is, is overweight as a result of their typical habits and what they've gotten used to and what they think is normal. I would say when it first started, very few people paid any attention to what that was going to do in the long term. Jello and you know all those kinds of um, artificial manufactured foods. In the 1950s, most meals were still cooked at home, but prepackaged convenience foods already existed and started to change human eating habits. People didn't really have the money then in order to be able to buy things in mass quantities, so it ended up being a small treat. But it was in such a small percentage of the diet that it didn't come to anybody's consciousness as to how it was going to affect us when it started happening in mass quantities. In the 1960s, space travel introduced innovative technologies in food science. New flavors, textures and packaging gave birth to a flood of new food addictions. Snacks, created to increase demand and profits during non-meal times. I remembered snacks of cheese Whiz and crackers, which is like really gross. Oftentimes it could be Chef Boyardee or SpaghettiOs or, you know, grilled cheese sandwiches or always Wonder Bread and Kraft slices. For many humans, snacks were good and heating up processed food was the same as cooking. They grew up thinking it was healthy then and many still think the same now. A lot of President's Choice frozen meals, lasagnas and, and shepherd's pies and things like that. Like processed food, fast food started as a treat. I can remember we had Kentucky Fried Chicken probably a couple times a month. And quickly became habit. A&W was where we went a lot of times. It was at McDonald's, maybe three, four times a week. By the 1970s, it was not unusual for humans with different schedules within each household to choose what they ate and when they ate it. Busy moms who used to focus on wholesome, balanced meals opted for just getting the household quickly and easily fed. This often meant choice was up to the individual, between vegetables and sweets. Most would opt for sugar. In 1972, British physiologist and nutritionist Dr. John Yudkin was already warning against sugar addiction. Discredited by the food industry's hired experts, it took another 40 years for scientific research to prove him right. In the mid-1970s, the dangers of sugar accelerated when the Republican administration allowed high fructose corn syrup into the food industry. Cheap corn syrup in processed food was the government's solution to both surplus corn and soaring food prices. I kind of tried to watch what I eat. However, through work, it's been somewhat of a challenge. I mean, I travel a lot, so you, you eat what you can when you're on the road and, you know, that kind of thing. More than 90% of American meals are spent on processed or fast food. What makes these foods so popular? You know, I went my entire life with, you know, stopping where I needed to to eat whatever I wanted to eat. 
Fast food and sodas are flavorful, but they are loaded with sugar, fat, and salt to make them taste better. A soda a day is equal to more than 15 pounds of body fat in a year, or a whopping 150 pounds a decade. The energy drink segment has also become very lucrative. Red Bull is the market leader, followed closely by Monster, which is partially owned by Coca-Cola. Ounce for ounce, Red Bull has the same amount of sugar as Coke. Fruit juices are just as bad. Fruits contain nutrients, but without the fiber, it's the same as drinking soda. If you have too much sugar in your diet, you end up creating an increase in the inflammation of your tissues. Excessive sugar intake also leads to the malfunction of hormones that control human appetite. Sugar is now embedded in human DNA. Humans eat it because they love the taste and are addicted to it. Sugar is available everywhere and is more easily addictive than drugs. Drugs will stimulate certain pleasure centers of the brain, but sugar lights up the entire brain. As other countries or otherwise healthy humans start adopting the habitual North American diet of fast processed foods, there is also a parallel decline in health. As a child, I, I did not typically snack. Then when I moved to Montreal, um, at the age of 12, I started discovering all kinds of food that I didn't know as a, a child coming from France. I started eating a lot more sugar than I used to eat before. Physician and psychiatrist Dr. Daniel Amen studies the difference between healthy and damaged brains and has a database of more than 120,000 images. The brain image of an overweight human is frightfully similar to those of alcoholics, drug addicts, and Alzheimer's. Too much sugar, way too many carbs. We have been using restaurants and processed foods like our grandparents used to use refrigerators. And it's a problem. If current eating habits continue, more than 50% of the adult population in most developed countries will be morbidly obese by 2030. The persistent drive or urge to eat is a largely preventable addiction. Obesity is one of the largest drivers of preventable chronic diseases. It is on the rise in every single developed and developing country except for France. Today, millions of humans live in areas with no access to any of the nutritious food needed to maintain a healthy, active life. Food deserts and food swamps are toxic environments found mainly in the low-income neighborhoods of large urban centers and small rural communities with the highest rates of diabetes and consumption of processed foods. But some cultures are not adversely affected. France, which has a reputation for rich food, is relatively free of either food deserts or food swamps. French families have one of the best eating habits among humans. When I grew up in France, my regular day was breakfast, lunch, dinner, and an afternoon snack after school. I was in a school where, you know, there was cooks for us, and so a hot meal every day. There was meat, vegetables, a balanced meal every day. During those days, I, there was no processed food. My family always refused to eat that. At lunchtime, I have a bit of proteins and, and, and vegetable. And in the evening, I try and eat light, uh, mostly uh, vegetable and probably some fish protein. Each of the areas have their own little marketplace with their fresh vegetables and fruit stands. Fast food represents about 35% of the commercial restaurant market in America, but in France, it's only 5%. Bistros throughout France offer healthy daily specials of freshly made protein, vegetables, and salads. You start to age, you hear stories about this guy's in the hospital and this girl's in the hospital and this guy had a heart attack, etc., etc. And I always said to myself, that's not going to be me. I felt as though, you know what, if I go for a run, if I stay active, if I run four times a week and I stay active, I'm, I am that guy that can eat whatever he wants and, and do whatever he wants. Don't be that guy that says to themselves, it's not going to happen to me because it is going to happen to you. Right, you take care. I still can't believe it. Uh, stroke. 
Bob's only 50. I was totally fine at baseball last week and now. It's all too common a story. Family and friends are stunned. He was so healthy, they claim. He played hockey every week, baseball in the summer. Some exercise is always better than none, but a weekly bout of rigorous exercise is simply not enough to keep the body healthy. In fact, one strenuous workout a week overstrains the body. The human pursuit for fulfillment and better lives seems to be a paradox. The easier and more comfortable the environment, the more stressful and toxic it is to health. Some may be prone to inactivity and others to overeating, but the combination of both is catastrophic. A fast track to chronic issues that are largely preventable. We've got a flood. We've got a flood of chronic disease. We've got a flood of poor nutrition. We've got a flood of calories and sugar. Although science clearly defines the nutritional needs for optimal human health, healthy choices are often clouded by marketing and or misleading packaging. Uh, looking at the laxity in front of package labeling laws, we do need help. This is not something education alone will fix. Obesity is spiraling out of control in the habitats of most developed nations and is also on the rise in every developing country that adopts the lifestyle habits of America where 40% of 45 to 64 year olds are obese and nearly half of them are already on prescription heart medication. So it's been uh, two, just over two weeks now since the triple bypass surgery. When you're in the cardiac ward, they, they, they talk to you a lot about what you should be eating versus what you have ate or what you thought was good food before. And as it turns out, as you start to do your homework online and you start to listen to people in the hospital, et cetera, et cetera, you start to figure out that that food is not necessarily as good as you thought it was. So to get back to normal where I was before, I would anticipate that's probably going to be six months to a year. Advancements in medicine, sanitation, and the ability to feed the masses have eradicated killer diseases of the past. And until now, significantly extended lifespans. But for the first time in history, human offspring are expected to have shorter lifespans than their parents. Is this the first step towards human extinction? Further analysis required. As for those who may live longer than their parents, is just being alive enough? Does quality of life matter? Some humans feel that longevity is a blessing only if their bodies are strong enough to enjoy life. With the number of people in the baby boomer generation getting older all at the same time, you know, there's going to be such a broad number of people who are going to be sick all at once. I just think that it's going to be overwhelming. You know, yes, we can put in new parts of the body and yes, we can replace organs, but if you're replacing it into a body that's already sick overall, how effective is that going to be? Plus, it's going to be, you know, astronomically costly. We live in a disposable society cars, appliances, and many tend to think of their health in the same way. Healthcare in most developed habitats can barely cover current medical needs. What will it be like in 10 years? Most humans use visual markers to determine the status of health. This body looks healthy. If a man has biceps and abs, he is probably healthy. Obesity is usually a good visual indicator of poor health but many who look overweight are in fact healthy. Thin humans are not necessarily healthy. A slim woman who weighs 120 pounds and has a body fat level of 30% or higher is medically speaking obese. Your fat weighs in at 36.8 pounds, giving you a body fat percentage at 31.9%. I'm what you call a skinny fat person. I did feel that I was getting thicker around the middle. Is it possible to alter the direction of declining health? Some humans have managed to do so by shifting from treatment to prevention. The point of exercise to me has always been being able to do other things. I suppose I was surprised as anyone when I discovered what it would take 
to stay healthy and mobile as I aged. In the beginning, it really had nothing to do with staying healthy and all about the way we looked. Like many, staying healthy took a back seat to my career. Excess of travel, expense accounts, and countless distractions began to take their toll and it became harder to stay fit. Problem was, what worked before didn't work as well anymore. Recently, when I've been losing weight, I would notice I'd lose muscle and still retain the fat. A lifetime of basketball was soon coming to an end as my joints just couldn't recover fast enough. Lots of um, athletes, certain muscles and joints end up getting a lot more impact than other joints. It became clear that my approach would have to change if I wanted to keep my mobility as I aged. The knee uh, would keep giving out. Basically, life happened. Some days energetic, some days extremely tired, but mostly tired. I think that they're aware somewhere in the back of their brains, but their day-to-day -day activity doesn't reflect that awareness because they will still sit there for hours on end. And sure enough, when I turned 50, I bent over one day and I couldn't stand up straight. Help me realize the accumulation of time, what it had done to my body. A person who is um, much more obese or just overweight typically has more weight on their joints. I thought I had serious back problems. They sometimes take offense when you try to explain to them that their path, everything that they've chosen to do, has led to this and they could have changed it at any point. And I could tell by just the way my body was, was, was breaking down on a daily basis, that if I didn't do something and commit to it, that's where I was gonna end up. As the 200 pounds of muscle is actually active functional tissue, and it supports the joints, it um, allows for um, good regular movement, it allows for better circulation through the system, whereas the, the fat is just something you have to carry around. It's not functional other than to stop you from starving if you're stuck in the desert. I probably gained about 30 pounds. There's a huge degree of weight bias in society. It affects people on a daily basis. And so there is a real drive from society to lead people to want to lose weight. I think it's a very arrogant message to suggest that there's only one right way to go. I think there's a lot of different people on this planet. and not only consequent to their own personal likes and dislikes, but their own personal realities. Different approaches will work differently for different people. A multi-billion dollar fitness and diet environment offers infinite solutions for better health. Started to get a little thicker around the middle and realized whatever I was doing wasn't actually enough to burn off all the calories I was eating. Wanted to lose weight, but I realized I also really wanted to develop muscle tone. So I had to eat fewer calories, or ratchet up the activity level. We're all looking for uh, the magic solution that's gonna work in a week. Eat less, move more. You know, that's as useful a piece of information as buy low, sell high would be to make people millionaires. Over the years, I've seen hundreds of weight loss plans, schemes, gadgets come and go. Oh, I tried so many things. I've read books, I bought CDs. Any approach that promises ultra-rapid weight loss, it's a worry for me because the only way to lose weight very rapidly is to either eat a very small number of calories or burn a huge number of calories or both. I was at the point where I, I don't even know if I want to try anything else. You don't need to be constant, you just need to be consistent. Unless you continue with whatever approach has helped you to lose the weight, the chances are the weight you lost doing that approach will come back. I bought so much different equipment, yoga mats, balls, uh, weights. And so extremes of effort tend to fail people in the long run. I think we need to take this more seriously because it does have a greater impact on our patient's health than any medication we could ever prescribe them. And when the GP told me that my body fat was at a very, very dangerous level, I thought, no way. I worked hard all my life, and I was not going to have fat cells endanger my health.
and affect my retirement. The positive impact of exercise on human health is limited without the good nutrition which is indispensable for healthy cell renewal. Medical schools don't teach nutrition particularly well. There is no nutrition course in medical school, meaning that it'll be bundled into other courses and other areas. What that also means is you could literally graduate from medical school having got every single exam question on nutrition wrong. That's a frightening thing. I learn more about conditions that I will likely never see in my clinical practice uh, than I did about nutrition and weight management. Humans are obligate omnivores and need a variety of nutrients. Fats for cell growth, proteins for reparation, carbohydrates for energy. I think that people don't generally fail diets. Um, diets generally fail people and indeed the environment conspires to make that happen. Everything that you take in in a day is going to be creating the, your cells, your muscles, your tendons, your ligaments, and that is not built well through chocolate cake. Psychological deprivation that people convince themselves that they are being deprived of something, like they have a God-given right to have a chocolate chip cookie. They don't. It's just a choice they make. The proper proteins, fruits, vegetables, water, those kinds of items to eat are actually what your body craves in order to be able to be healthy. I don't think we have a difficulty in underconsumption here in Canada. We have an overabundance of food and high caloric, high density calorie foods. So there's no physiological deprivation, right? Well, when you're in the cardiac ward, they, they, they talk to you a lot about what you should be eating versus what you have ate or what you thought was good food before. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, as you start to do your homework online and you start to listen to people in the hospital, et cetera, et cetera, you start to figure out that that food is not necessarily as good as you thought it was, so. Because people do often lose lots of weight with suffering. They just don't keep the weight they've lost through suffering off. And so the challenge for patients sometimes is getting rid of that dieter's mentality that the world has cultivated over the years. And then of course, the challenge of change itself. You can be 25 years old and have a 50-year-old body in mind. There's a silent carnage that the human body suffers from regular interaction with their modern habitat. For some, it has created a companionship with pain. Many feel helpless and more vulnerable over time. What does being healthy mean to humans? Healthy is a funny word. To be healthy is to have a state of mind and a body that is able to react, to survive at a maximum optimal, optimal capacity. Uh, being healthy is exercising on a regular basis and eating properly. To eat properly, to exercise, to keep control of your body. It's not only about eating properly, it's a, it's a way of life. Eating crap is not good. Also remind yourself that you're worth it. We've got to take the responsibility for our own individual health. Nobody is going to say, you've got to do it. So I've made lots of changes to my daily life. So um, eating habits um, are the biggest thing that I'm, the biggest change I think that I'm making in my life right now. To me, it's easier to face the reality of personal responsibility than to let time have its way with you. You know, if, if you really want to become healthy, it has to become your new life, it has to become who you are, and not just something you have to do. It's not a diet, it's a lifestyle choice. It just has to be part of your life and your living that you enjoy good food. It's eating properly, it's doing weight training, it's doing aerobics, it's getting enough sleep, it's managing the stress in your life, all of these things. Oh, if one of them is out of whack, it really makes the work that you're doing on the other ones less effective. I think good health is really an individual choice. It is a work in progress to become a healthy person. You are your first line of defense for taking care of your health. Once you decide you want it, you just do what it takes to get it, period. This body certainly feels a lot better when it has regular exercise and good nutrition. medical science the way it is, uh, people at my age have a very high statistic probability of living to be 90 years old. And I want to make sure that when I get to be
be 90 years old, I'm still in pretty good shape. I'm active, and uh, you know, as long as my brain keeps working, I don't want my body to give up. Don't be that guy that says it's not going to happen to you. Uh, stay active, watch what you eat, and, and I can't stress enough, watch what you eat.